Next up, it was like a scene out of a Hollywood blockbuster, half past midnight on St. Patrick's Day in 1990, when much of Boston was still celebrating. Two thieves dressed up as cops made their way into the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum and walked out with a fortune in art now worth roughly a half billion dollars. We now know that a lot of local wise guys were scoping out the museum. They were casing it. Anybody who was a thief, an art thief, knew about the gun. It was an easy, easy score, as they say on the street. It's the biggest art heist the world has ever seen. And 30 years later, the paintings, which include works from Degas, Manet, and the only Rembrandt seascape in existence are still missing, as are the perpetrators, despite a $10 million reward. A new docuseries out today on Netflix follows the investigation through three decades of leads, some lucky breaks, and dead ends. It's called This is a Robbery. The filmmakers, Nick and Colin Barnacle, join me now. Congratulations, gentlemen. The thing is totally great. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having us. So this film uh, and its detail, let's face it, is the work of the obsessed. You know, people of certain age in Boston qualify, but I am guessing that you guys were barely born when this thing happened. So what's the allure? Nick, starting with you. I think the allure here, as we allude to it in a few of the episodes, it's Gardner's sickness. You absolutely become obsessed with the, with, with the whodunit, finding out who done that, who did this, and, and following each clue to its conclusion. I think Colin did an unbelievable job of putting this together. And through the four episodes, there's so much information coming at you. You can see why it's unsolved. But in the end, the platform of Netflix is kind of going to give everyone in the world a chance to put this thing together and maybe find these paintings. Colin, what drew you? Uh, I think it, let, let's see, it's the 31 year old and I'm 35, so I was four when this happened. Um, so <laughs> I feel like even for my generation, it's. It's obsessive because of the fact that Boston operates like a small town. Yeah. Everybody knows each other, and you feel like the pool is so finite that you should be able to figure this out. You know where it went. It's a you know half a million people in the city, um, Metro Boston, and everybody knows each other. It's one degree, so it's almost a you know a familial thing where you feel like you you just you, you should know the people who robbed it or, or you should have heard something about it um and it's also kind of the obsessive compulsion of almost you know chess the more the better you are at chess the more moves you can see on the board the crazier you go and that's kind of what happens with this case you know, uh, as you said, Nervin, it was still unsolved. We'll get to that in a couple of seconds. But uh, there's a theory that I think is quite clearly true, that if you don't solve something quickly, it's less likely that it ever gets solved. Here's Kevin Cullen from the Boston Globe speaking to that exact issue in your film. Put it this way. Back in 1990, you're an FBI agent. The way you get a promotion, the way you get a raise, through a big mafia case. Culture hadn't changed. That was still how you got your name in the papers, still how you got your people on the news. Solving an art theft versus a mafia prosecution in 1990, what do you think is going to get more attention? Nick, do you buy that theory that they really didn't give a damn? Not that they didn't give a damn, but at the time in 1990, you've got the FBI and you've got the Boston Police Department not talking to each other. Um, we happen to have a relation. Our late Uncle Paul was a uh, detective with the Boston Police Department at the time. And Kevin, I think, nails it. That's Doyle's, by the way, behind him. Uh, he talks about that strike and that, that disconnection coming right into the investigation as they enter the scene that morning, March 18th. And it's a disturbed scene by the time the FBI gets there. And the Boston Police Department and the FBI, they have some things they need to sort out. You know, Colin, I'm a little bit older than you, too, so I was, uh, uh, I've was i been uh, following this as an adult as well. There are things, parts of this, beyond the who done it, done it and where are the paintings, that I'm obsessed with. When you entered this thing, was there one piece other than the who done it and where the paintings are that you really wanted to explore, and how far did you get on that thing? Yeah, I felt like the one thing that we could do and the one thing that I – we really wanted to do was give a real intimate portrayal of 
you know, that night, the crime scene, really the three hours within the crime scene from about, you know, a little bit before midnight to a little afterwards. Um, that was our kind of one of our primary goals. And I think we really did, did that pretty well. Um, really shed some light on, you know, what happened during those 81 minutes where the robbery is occurring. But in terms of specifics, I think everybody's kind of intrigued with, you know, what happened in the blue room how is it that one of the guards goes through there at 1227 and that's it? No thief goes in there according to the, the alarm printout. I think that is the kind of mystery within the mystery that kind of everybody wants to know. And, you know, there's so many other details within that night. A fire alarm going off, a glass break alarm going off. What does it all mean? Do those, are those parts to the puzzle or are those kind of red herrings? That's kind of what we wanted to focus on. You know, I, I still can't believe it was 81 minutes. They were in that place. With me, yeah. it's like they took that worthless thing, I don't know if it's worthless, on top of a flag and they didn't yeah. take a Rembrandt self-portrait. When it's so well planned, it's obvious, it's unbelievable. So, so Nick, the, the, I don't want to give anything away that you don't want to give away, but while I think it's fair to say that maybe you didn't assemble enough evidence for an indictment and a conviction at a trial. It seems to me by the end you came pretty close to telling people who you thought were, be, were behind this. How much of that do you want to share tonight? Well, you're going to have to, you know, tune in and, and yeah, watch the whole thing. Give me a little talk. something, will you? I think in the very end, you have the pieces as the viewer to draw a conclusion. And we lay it out. It's a documentary. There's no voiceover. We're not in it. So yeah. the evidence is there. And there was a little bit of kismet. There was a little bit of luck on our part. Um, there were some individuals that kind of uh, appear in the film that uh, were able to get out of jail while we were filming, which was a piece of luck, his luck and ours. Not uh, for Massachusetts, though. Maybe not for Massachusetts. <laughs> um, and all the pieces are there to put it together. I, I think that we draw a pretty damn close conclusion. And I think the most exciting part here is that there is a $10 million reward and those pieces of art are out there. Yeah, are we ever gonna see these paintings in your estimation? I know that's just Nostradamus work, but are we ever gonna see them? I, look, I think that traditionally what you hear is that the 13 pieces of art were split up. I think we, we adhere to that theory as well. I do think that we will see some of these pieces of art maybe in the near future. Again, the power of Netflix's platform, every country in the world, save two same day and date who knows where these are but this is a the best shot they've had at, at, at coming back to boston colin i only have 30 seconds you as convinced as your brother that you guys identified the perps yes we went through hundreds of interviews thousands of pages of court documents we vetted every single theory you could in this from the the strange to the weird to the the least plausible to be able to make a four-part series where you know, we put down on record what we think is the most plausible uh, events of that night and who did it and why they did it. And hopefully where comes out of this. It's the largest wanted poster in the world on Netflix. Well, no spoiler here, but I'm telling everybody at home should be watching this thing. Gentlemen, congratulations. It's a great piece of work. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Good to see you. The series again is This is a Robbery, the World's Biggest Art Heist. You can watch it now on Netflix.